Louise, thanks for doing this and thanks Natalie for um, uh, making sure the whole uh, show stays on the road. Um, it is timely and, and one of the things that people have been saying, it seems almost spookily present, prescient. Um, th that's a matter of luck to some degree and it's also, a, a, I suppose if I have any one skill apart from getting bored very easily, it's detecting rising waves of interest in new uh, agendas and I started I started to feel this uh, some years ago and and, and and that shared across I think the uh, Bolland's uh, team but this sense that the 20s the night the 2020s would be just different that they would be a decade where things happen much more uh, rapidly and unexpectedly than we, we um, had got used to that's what's been behind all of this and that's I think in a way why we descri describe the coming decade as the exponential uh, decade. I I'll stop there and I'm happy to take further questions and elaborate if you want. I'm gonna go straight in then, John. And so exponential decade, everything is changing. Apart from pandemic numbers, which I think everybody's getting used to this idea of exponential and the numbers doubling all the time. Yeah. You know, what else is going exponential? What, what's the, what are the positives potential exponentials that we might see? Well, in a way, I mean, some people um, on the call know that um, one of the things that I've been hammering for a while now is that much as I love the sustainability industry of which many of us are a part, um, I think much of the effort, much of the activity, much of the ambition in the movement has been largely incremental. I mean, let's get particularly business to be a bit nicer, uh, a bit more open, a bit more accountable uh, and all of that good stuff. But I actually went to see somebody in 2005, uh, Kevin Kelly, who was the, one of the founding editors of Wired magazine. And some people may know he came up with books like Out of Control and New Rules for the New Economy. And he talked then about uh, a period in our collective history where we were moving from a world of decreasing returns, where the more of whatever we were doing, we did, uh, the less the, the return would be over time to a world of increasing returns. And, and digitalization and information technology, the whole uh, new economy were very much part of that. But maybe three or four years ago, I then went back to California and went to see people like X Prize Foundation and Singularity University and Google's X facility and so on, just to meet some of the people who were really trying to um, explain to the world why the new technologies, but new mindsets and, and, and new circumstances in which we were all operating were going to take us on exponential uh, trajectories. Now at the time, that seemed like going into foreign territory and these people were borderline weird, borderline crazy, but over time I think people have begun to realize that they're actually working on um, areas of the economy, areas of technology, new types of business model, new sort of market dynamics, which increasingly feel as though they're, they're intrinsic to what comes um, next. So um, I, I'll stop there, but I'll, I'll come back to that question about positive versus uh, negative exponentials in a moment. Do you want to do it now? To talk <laughs> yeah, well, I can, I can try. Um, so, I mean, the, the book, Green Swans, um, obviously riffs, and it's declared right from the outset in the book on the work of Nassim Nicholas Taleb. And many people will know uh, many of his books, but one in particular, uh, The Black Swan, which was published in 2007, just as we were headed towards the 2007-2009 uh, crash. And um, what he talked about uh, were these events which had three primary characteristics. One was that they came out of the blue. They were utterly unexpected. The second was they had an off-the-scale level of impact. Now that could be positive, but largely it's negative, uh, at least in the first instance. And then the third characteristic was once they'd hit, uh, we tended to sort of reflect on what had just happened to us and misunderstand, by which uh, Taleb was saying we were setting ourselves up for failure again. So for example, when Vale, uh, the mining company in Brazil, had its at a catastrophic dam burst, few years back and 300 people drowned in mud. Uh, they said that was a black swan. It wasn't um, 
imaginable, it wasn't predictable. Well, they'd had exactly a similar downburst two years before, which killed 30 people, so uh, fewer, but, but all of the evidence was there if they'd chosen to pay attention, they chose not to. And it's exactly the same, and, and Taleb himself has said that in relation to COVID-19. There are all sorts of people saying, this is a black swan, uh, and there are even people now talking about the collapse and the price of oil as a double black swan in the sense that we don't have enough storage uh, to cope with all the oil that is being produced uh, and at a time when the Russians and Saudis are competing with each other to sort of flood the world with oil. So whether it's a single black swan or a double black swan, uh, Taleb says no, it's not. We, people saw the pandemic risk. Uh, governments had set up units uh, to deal with the pandemic risk. Uh, in the White House, they shut it down. In the UK, they shut it down. Um, so, you know, we had a chance to um, be sensible. We chose largely not to uh, take it. So that's, that's the negative. That's the black swan. And those things largely take us exponentially in a direction that we don't particularly want to go. Uh, the green swan idea is very simple. It's just saying, could it be that in the same way that you have breakdown and you have breakthrough, could it be that there would be solutions and they might be technologies, they might be uh, new mindsets, they might be new business models, they might be new forms of economics, uh, which would take us exponentially in the right uh, direction? And the answer is yes, they're there. They behave rather differently to black swans, but, but they are there. So that, that, that's where the, the theme of the book came from. Okay, so just a reminder, if anybody has more questions, we have plenty of time to, to get to them. That was the point of um, an hour and a half. Um, I'm gonna take a step back, John, and just, you, um, you're an avid reader. Um, in fact, I always feel like I'd never, I don't read enough when I'm around you. So what, are there any specific books that have inspired this or specific styles that you've, you've drawn on that you enjoy? Or, do you want to talk a little bit about how your reading informs not just what's in your work, but the style and how you engage? Well, I am a compulsive reader and anyone who visits our home will see that it's largely built out of books. Um, but uh, if I think back to books that have had a really major impact on me and I, I think have contributed to uh, the theme um, and the framing of Green Swans, there's one book that stands out beyond all of the others. Now, I could say Silent Spring with Rachel, Car Rachel Carson. I read that in the early 1960s. It had a huge impact on me, but that's not the book that I'm going to name. The book I will name um, uh, was uh, written by um, a philosopher called Thomas Kuhn. It's called uh, the, Structure of Scientific Re Re Sorry, the Structure of Scientific Revolutions. It came out again in the early 1960s. And it was the book that introduced the uh, we're getting a feedback. If people could mute them, that would be great. Mute themselves. Um, uh, so the, the structure of scientific revolutions talked about paradigm shifts. And but what Kuhn meant by that was most of our history, and they tend to come through every 70 to 80 years uh, where everything changes and where it's absolutely shocking and disconcerting for people who were brought up in the old order to suddenly start to experience aspects of the new order and one of the one of the reasons why it takes so long is that the old paradigm has been taught by and taught to uh, several generations so you have to have the the sort of pioneering um, uh, people die as Milton Friedman did sadly perhaps but, um, and the people that they then taught and people who've been infected with that same view uh, of the world and I think we're coming out of a paradigm which was shareholder driven, uh, limitless earth. I mean, that, the, 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 the many aspects of what people have believed are now beginning to crumble, but the new order is not yet sufficiently clear for most people to really move forward in, 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 a, in, in the right way, I think. So that would be the book I would uh, pick. And is it out of print? <laughs> no, it's in print. And one, one of the really funny things was, I have about five copies around the uh, uh, house because I keep losing it and then buying new copies. Uh, it's, it's in various paperback forms. 
And one of the reasons I buy it is I can't, at times I've been unable to believe what I thought I remembered, because I read this book when I was 14 first. And, and what I, what I, one of the things I remembered from it was a set of optical experiments that were done in Hanover at the end of the 19th uh, century. And I, I'm going through this because it absolutely bears on the question of what a paradigm shift is and where we might be finding ourselves uh, now. And in the optical experiments, people may remember, but they put distorting lenses on human subjects' uh, heads, covering their eyes totally and they left them on. They didn't take them up, off after an hour or a day or a week, they left them on. And these things inverted the visual field. So you would experience, you'd see the world upside down. And then in a growing proportion, small but growing proportion, the, the people who'd been fitted with these lenses, they, they started to feel really nauseous and, and the world started to wobble. And then in, again, a growing proportion, the visual field flipped. So even though they were wearing the distorting uh, lenses, they started to see the world as it should be, because that's what the other senses were telling uh, that was uh, going on. And the point that Kuhn was making is that paradigm shifts are very much like that transition where you go from something that you thought you took for granted through a period where you're deeply existentially disturbed, and some people never get over that, and then you come out into a new world which is in some ways transformed. Not always for the better, but but it would be transformed. So yeah, it, it's still available in print and I hope it will stay in print. But it's not a brilliantly written book. I mean, I, I, the one thing that strikes me when I go back to it is it's quite hard to read, even though it's quite short, but it's a very powerful read. Right. I guess we've, we've just had a question come in that I'm gonna jump straight to, yeah. which says, um, it's from Ranald Boyle, uh, which says, what is the relative value of mass public action like Extinction Rebellion or Student Strike versus the corporate or government intervention? Your triple bottom line was aimed at corporates, for example. Yeah, no, it, 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 it's a great question, Ronald. Thanks very much indeed. And, and um, for me, uh, the mass movements are crucial. So for example, most people on the call or in this um, book club will know that tomorrow, the 22nd of April, is Earth Day and it's the 50th anniversary of Earth Day and one of the things that we have posted today on our website is a series of interviews with the co-founder of the Earth Day movement, Dennis Hayes. Um, and I think Earth Day did more than any other single movement to create the agenda which most of the people uh, are involved in this conversation are now involved in. So, over 20 million Americans came out onto the streets in protest in 1970. Uh, and Nixon, uh, President Nixon, was so shocked by that. He uh, allowed through or enabled the Clean Air Act, the Clean Water Act, the Environmental Protection Agency, the shockwaves went international, the first environmental uh, UN conference happened in 1972, very, very much stimulated by uh, all of that. So I think, I think mass movements are enormously important. We're doing our bit uh, to support uh, Earth Day this time around. You mentioned Extinction Rebellion, uh, and, and some people on the call will know that in April of last year, uh, just before, in fact, it was in March, before the Extinction Rebellion protest started in London, uh, we invited in uh, uh, one of the uh, co-founders of the XR uh, movement, because I just wanted to understand who they were and what we were trying to do. I was so impressed that when, when the protest started, uh, we, we swung in behind it uh, and, and were then asked to help support by linking up to uh, the business world. We did a letter to the Times with 23 CEOs of one sort or another, most notably Paul Holman, uh, former CEO uh, Unilever, signing it. And, you know, people who are thoughtful know that there is a limit to what politicians, what governments, what business can do without the support of, without pressure from uh, ordinary people, be they as uh, voters, as citizens, as consumers, investors, uh, or whatever. So I think mass movements are, are, are fundamentally important. I think they quite often find it difficult to gain traction. It's been very interesting to see XR uh, fading to some degree. I hope they uh, don't uh, fade from the scene uh, entirely. But final point, I think the school climate strikes are fundamentally important. I think they've given 
uh, a much younger cohort in our populations the experience of taking direct action, of understanding why they're being encouraged uh, to do that, and then getting to developing that sense of to what extent are politicians hearing us, to what extent are people and governments uh, then acting in appropriate ways. And in terms of enabling the democratic instincts and potential of a generation or two, I think the, the school climate strikes have been phenomenally uh, important. Okay, um, thank you. And um, just jumping to a slightly different question, one of the pieces I'm gonna read a little bit from the book um, is that, I, that resonated with me was this piece around miracles where you write that a miracle is more than an event. Yeah. So, so apologies, it's something that's impossible from one's current understanding of reality and truth. But that becomes possible from a new understanding. It's more than an event, it's an invitation that says the universe is bigger than you thought it was and invites us to step into that. Uh, sort of that's when you were talking about the um, optical experiments, that sounds a bit like that. But my question really is, how can you practice that switch without being part of a medical experiment with glasses on? How do you see people starting to practice that habit of, of, of seeing whether it's miracles or slightly further into the future? Well, as you know, Louise, I mean, I have antibodies to most religions. I was brought up in rather strange places around the world, Northern Ireland, Israel, and so on. And everywhere we traveled, this was in the 1950s, um, people were at each other's throats because of religion. I, I happen to believe that spirituality and the right sort of religious framing can be very positive. I don't, I don't deny that for the moment. The idea of miracles to us now is taken a, you know, a flash from the sky and somebody's not, knocked off their donkey or uh, water is turned into wine or whatever. But if you, if you go back to what the reality of those experiences was, maybe a, a figure like Jesus encouraged people to think of water as wine. And when they drank water with that sort of uh, frame of mind, it tasted glorious. And in the right company, again, it tasted glorious. And maybe the feeding of 5,000 people who didn't want to share were encouraged to share and food went a lot long, uh, 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 much further than in normal times. And I think we're at one of those moments where here in the UK, those people who live in the UK, uh, you and I live in uh, London, but um, with every Thursday now we have the uh, ordinary people coming out into the streets and applauding, banging saucepans and so on, the National Health Service. Well, we know, the NHS is a, a little bit of a, a, a religious icon for, 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 for Britons. Um, but there's something happening there that people are suddenly experiencing a community by being part of it, rather than simply going off to the train or whatever in the morning and, 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 and really not relating to the wider world. So I think there is a, the, the, at the local level, and this isn't uh, uniform, but in some countries, uh, people are rediscovering community and I think that local level of the sustainability agenda is absolutely crucial. If we neglect it, if we forget it, if we allow it to weaken, uh, we weaken everything that we um, uh, do. And I think people also uh, are able to make links. So some people are worried that COVID-19 and, and, and the lockdown will have people forgetting the climate emergency, you know, the droughts, the fires, the floods, uh, cities like uh, Cape Town or Sao Paulo running out of water or almost, they don't, they haven't forgotten that. And I think that's, and I think what people are beginning to understand, and again, it's, it, it, it's, it's moving from one reality to another, is how ferociously and furiously and generally constructively in the old order, but um, things are linked together. So the Chinese wet markets in Wuhan and other places, very tightly linked to wildlife tra trafficking, absolutely the epicenter of this latest uh, pandemic and a number of them before, before that. Everything is linked. The rising global temperatures are encouraging the spread of infectious diseases. And our thinking, our mindsets, our governments, our politics, our governments are not set up in a way that uh, enable them to properly understand those system conditions. Now, I think you know, you could imagine that we continue on that route and our civilization collapses. 
but equally you could think under those circumstances a different generation starts to try breakthrough solutions things that haven't been uh, thought possible and that's where the miracle comes in because things that seemed impossible in the old order the old reality become not only possible but almost seemingly inevitable uh, in the new world in the new reality now i don't think this is going to happen overnight i think this is going to be almost a generational handover process where the boomers get out of the way over time and i'm a boomer uh, and a new set of generations come through but uh, you know th these generational uh, groups again have to so work very closely together so and, and um so when you talk about local level so jumping to the re regenerative living systems there's a lot written about we have to come back to bioregional level yeah. and we can't keep working on this um, assumption that everything can be globalized and scaled out uh, you I'm not going to ask because we've had this discussion <laughs> um, how long is, is this going to last but but really the process of shifting from one paradigm to another I know you studied it in the waves of that for a long time I is think, it a decade do we yeah. we're, we're talking uh, forever uh, and you know every civilization in the end collapses and I mean again um, books that had a massive impact on me when I was at school uh, were, were by Toynbee and they were about the rise and fall of uh, civilizations. Um, the question is how long we can extend our civilization without taking down the biosphere uh, with us and there are many things that we've done gen generally unwittingly to create the carbon load in the atmosphere uh, deplete uh, the fertility of soils and the structure of soils around the world, to acidify the oceans and drive the sort of coral system bleaching that we're increasingly seeing. Do I think that's going to go overnight? No, I think it's going to get substantially worse and because all of these things uh, are inter interrelated uh, one to the other. But isn't it extraordinary in the lockdown to see kangaroos back in cities, to see not just parakeets, but all sorts of other wildlife uh, coming back into our uh, cities. It's almost as though the natural world is waiting to um, uh, take over for us, from us when, when we collapse. I hope that we won't collapse. I hope that we can actually rebuild. But this is something that can't simply be done by individuals, either individual citizens or individual companies. It's got to be a collective effort. It's got to be steered. Governments and politicians have got to uh, lead, I mean properly lead. Final point here is, I think it was Winston Churchill who once said, extraordinary times call forth extraordinary leaders. And one of those points where I think in 15 to 20 years from now, we will be led by people, guided by people we've never heard of. I look at Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand a couple of years ago, I'd never heard of her, but what a model of modern uh, leadership, not just female leadership, leadership, uh, people like her uh, provide now. Sure. Um, and actually picking up on that, Teen Ward from uh, Rockflower has yes. sent a, a wonderful question. It's quite long, so I'm going to try and do it justice, Teen, and, and please put your hand up if I'm not doing it justice or if John doesn't answer it properly. Um, it goes along leadership and and the masculine type and, and, and feminine in a sense. So whether um, elevating um, women um, and girls and in society will provide the right tree structure. So a very specific part of that question is, can a leader like um, Twitter founder Jack Dorsey kind of by focusing his new uh, philanthropy on universal basic income and education and health in women and girls, is that the kind of thing that will have sort of quantifiable effects is the ultimate green swan really the redressing of this balance between the masculine and the feminine both for planet and for people so I, I hope i've done just this about I, I think it's a fascinating question and i think it's um extremely provocative and it, it and, and it's actually extremely useful and i think uh, i don't know what the ultimate green swan would be but if we think of green swans as trajectories that take us towards things that previously seemed uh, impossible at a growing and increasingly, at least for a while, exponential rate. 
then I don't think there's any question, there's, there should be no doubt. I was on the phone yesterday with people in Jordan and they were saying uh, many of the meetings, many of the committees, many of the government structures are almost exclusively male. I think in, again, 20 or 30 years, we'll look back at that as a complete, not aberration, because that's what we've done for much of our species uh, development. But I don't think that's fit for purpose and what's coming. And I think of a great friend and colleague over the years, Paul Hawkin, who um, developed Project Drawdown. Many people know uh, Drawdown now run by Eric John Foley. And one of, the, one of the absolutely crucial sets of solutions that they identified in terms of dealing with uh, the climate emergency was the education of girls and the support and engagement of women. So um, it's been very interesting just in the last week or so to see uh, the media, including the business media, reflecting, beginning to reflect on why it is that the countries that typically are doing much better in what's just happening to us tend to be run by women. I mentioned uh, Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand, but you look at Germany with um, Angela Merkel and so on. It, yeah. it's, it's not an accident that some of the people who are dealing with complexity in a measured, calm and effective way are not men. And what you see quite often with the men, you think about Bolsonaro in Brazil with Trump in uh, the United States, not quite in the same class, but Boris Johnson here in the UK. These people get scratchy and they get angry when confronted with something that's outside their experience. They just want it done. They want it to be over. They want to ignore it, shut their eyes and believe that it goes away. And I don't think women do that to quite the same uh, degree. So just, just the question is spot on. How we do that, I don't know. But I'll bet you again that in, and, and it's not simply uh, uh, men like me saying, we're going to let more women in if that's even within our control. It's women just stepping up and taking over uh, because it's in their um, capacity to do so. And I think that's, that, that is a new natural order that will be established. Uh, how it plays through and how men react, that will be interesting. And I'm just gonna add a bit to that question. So Bettine, if you have any additional comments to that, please jump into the chat um, and, and Natalie can let you speak as well. Um, because we talk about men and women, is it not more to do with different qualities or styles that have traditionally been encouraged in women rather than in men? So that men have had more of the Bolsonaro type masculine leadership, but it's not a men female. Like for me, it's it's more masculinity feminine, and that actually men can display some of those characteristics yeah. if you just let them. I think that's absolutely true. And you look at somebody like Obama. Uh, in the US and you contrast him with somebody like Nixon or Reagan or Trump to take a series of Republicans perhaps um, and contrast them with the Democrat. O Obama I I is male but he, he um, uh, practices certain things that we tend perhaps more to associate with women so I agree this is a style of leadership as much as it is a, a, a gender shift or a gender quake or whatever we uh, mm -hmm. but um, I, th I think women are going to have to lead in what comes next. And I just, I, I think it is in the very nature of this new uh, century of ours that it's going to test us to and beyond uh, the limit. And the final uh, thing I'll say on that is that, and I've said this before in public, I, I, I don't think that the human brain that is currently configured and wired is up to the task of dealing with the challenges that we've created as well of ours. And so I think so, there has to be a yeah. shift from male to female styles of thinking, but we have to accentuate and amplify and support our thinking with very different technologies. And I think big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence, artificial wisdom, are, are potentially a huge part of that. And, and remembering actually the nascent days of talking about this book, there was yeah. it was more of an AI focus. Do you yeah, want to talk about what have you cut out? <laughs> so do, uh, do you want to let people, you know, because well, the theme of course is still there. Yeah, I mean, part of the, um, my character is, you know, I'm nosy, I'm curious, I want to go and see what people are doing. So 
when I started the book, I went to see people uh, like DeepMind, who just before they were acquired by uh, Google, I, I had conversations with people, at, for example, HP uh, in Palo Alto uh, around what they're doing in AI. And I have absolutely no doubt that some of these new technologies will enable us to do, if we choose to use them in the right way, enable us to manage this planet increasingly, take over responsibility for running it um, in, in ways that are more sustainable. But it's not guaranteed. And I think very often what, we, what the book was partly about initially, and it's still uh, in there uh, yeah. to some degree, was unintended consequences. The fact that whatever we do, uh, it, it turns out to do things that we didn't expect or intend. Thank you. Um, I might keep AI in my pocket to discuss more in a little bit because um, there's lots of questions coming in. I'm going to uh, jump to Anna Terrell's question, uh, which says, in recent years, we've heard much about the need for business to step up and into spaces historically considered the domain of the government, for example, social environment themes. Post COVID-19, how do you see the dynamic between the public and the private sectors evolving? And do you think we can achieve the degree of co cross-sector collaboration that's really required to scale regenerative capitalism? Um, thanks, Anna, for the question. It's a big I, one. The, the, sorry? Yeah, it's a big one. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a, it's big a, question. And um, let, me, let me try and sort of creep up on it. Um, I've spent 40 years working with business because when I started, uh, most businesses uh, were completely um, opposed to uh, getting quite a lot of background noise. Somebody is not on mute, I think. Okay. Um, so when, when I started, I, I, I worked for government for a while uh, and then I decided to focus on business in the, in the mid 1970s. And at that stage, business, corporations, companies were absolutely not interested in talking about health, safety, environmental issues, these sorts of things. And they, they thought anything that was trying to engage in that world was going for the throat. And I've, I've said that uh, repeatedly. And when younger people say to me, we've made no progress over all of those decades, my response is, we've made extraordinary progress now because these things are routinely debated at boardroom and C-suite uh, level in the ways that they, they would not have been uh, in, in, in that prior period. The problem is that even if you work with a very large group of companies through their supply chains and value webs and so on, there is a limited degree to which you can change the systemic rules within which they operate. So for example, uh, We've had Mark Benioff and people like him, Martin Wolf of the Financial Times saying, capitalism is broken. We had the Financial Times, you know, time for a reset, banner co uh, cover, and they continued with that theme. But then you had Warren Buffett saying, all of that may be true, but it's up to politicians and it's up to, to governments and it's up to policymakers to create the conditions in which um, uh, uh, business can do the right thing. So to the question, around the future rebalancing uh, of the, uh, the worlds of the private sector and the, uh, uh, the public sector, I think for, it may be four or five years, it may be longer, um, the public sector is going to be overwhelmingly in the driving seat in ways that we haven't had experience of since the uh, immediate post-World War II okay. period. Yeah. Um, thank you. That's, it, that's really interesting because, so Chantal has actually asked a question that I think fits in perfectly here, which says, how do you see the role of big environmental organisations to shape the future? Having worked in a few, with a few of them, it seems that over the year they seem to be less grounded to local realities. That might, is it just my impression, she writes, would love to hear your comment on that. So I think the role of, of big environmental organisations and then your impression as to whether they're less grounded in local realities that they're going to need to be. Yeah, it's interesting. And I think it's a very mixed uh, bag in a way. And, and those people who know me uh, and know my history uh, will perhaps recall that I first got involved with the World Wildlife Fund in its first year when 
I was 11, it was 1961, and I'm now on the Council of Ambassadors of WWF, and I have been for quite some time. And I've worked with groups like the World Resources Institute, the Environmental Defense Fund, Friends of the Earth, Greenpeace, a range of different activities um, and initiatives. I think they played an incredibly important role in creating the understanding that we now have, but I think they are now struggling often to operate and maintain the level of influence and the voice that they had uh, from the 60s, uh, well, the last 40 years. Of the last mm. So um, I think there is, a, there is a, um, a challenge that comes up when people start to use the language that you've evolved and used to advance agenda. How can people tell whether they're, they're properly doing what you've called on them to do or not? Um, so I think it's a very challenging period, but I hope to God that these larger and, and many smaller green and environmental and, and sustainability organizations don't disappear. But we will see a massive evolutionary shakeout. Uh, a lot of these, lot of these organizations will prove unfit for purpose. I'm going to put you on the spot, John. Because um, I remember having a conversation, I think, with you and then um, the folks from Global Optimism, so Christiana Figueres mm -hmm. and um, Tom and Chloe, that you know, with the rise in in activism, this the environmental and, and other social organisations had to change quite significantly and the suggestion was should we bring them together to give them some advice and to let them you know to to, to catalyze this change faster because there's a lot of resources in those organizations what would your what would be your top tip and i know you know most of the heads of some of the big organizations um, personally if they came to you and said john what would be your biggest advice right now in how they evolve where they go what they should be thinking about differently than they have in the work they've done for the past many decades? Well, the, one of the inter I mean, I do know a fair number of people in space, but there was a period when I knew many more of the leaders of the, the big sort of campaigning organizations than I do now, because there's been churn and people have changed. And also because in a way, I've become less interested in some of the organizations as they, they've okay. become part of the operating system in a way. And I think, that's what's happening. Many of, these, many of these organizations are now doing profoundly good and important work, but it's not visible. And so they've, they've transitioned from a world where they had to make a lot of noise in order to develop the profile that attracted foundation and particularly citizen uh, support. And now a lot of their funding is coming from the corporate world and, and, and similar. And that, that, it, that changes the way in which organizations operate it also to some degree constrains the ways in which they can think. And one of the things that's really interested me is to see groups like WWF, for example, supporting quietly, covertly to some degree, the school climate strikes. Because I think that's what needs yeah. to be, there needs to be a transfer of resources, of political influence, of, of, of networking and so on, across the generations, not just human generations, but organizational ones as well. Interesting. Um, and actually, she's not here with me, um, but I'm going to ask from a climate strike, uh, Frida, yeah. what would be your advice to them? So my 16 year old daughter, who's very active in the UK um, school climate network, what would be your advice in how they go about this and not dilute and lose the impact? Well, I think um, one, of, one piece of advice, and it's something I learned quite hard, is that younger people um, become upset by the world and the way it's going uh, quite often, and um, they become angry. And, and that's quite, I, it's very easy to say, don't become angry, but I think it's, it's destructive in many ways if people become so angry uh, that they just try and beat up the system. And I, 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 I told you, Louise, but I, you know, when I was at university, uh, first time around, one of my friends, um, later joined the angry brigade and she went to prison for 10 years because she tried to blow up British government ministers, um, which wasn't seen to be a good thing, but, but she just became insane. <laughs> um, and, and other, the weathermen in the States, the Baden-Meinhof uh, group, gang, whatever, uh, in the Germany were uh, equivalents. My own daughter, oldest daughter, um, went to prison for three days in 
Scotland for, for shutting down the M77 when the Secretary of State uh, for Scotland opened it on television and all the rest of it. And you know, I, I look at her generation of activists who tried to slow down the motorway construction uh, effort by chaining themselves to trees, sleeping up in trees, whatever it was. I think fantastic. And again, you saw Friends of the Earth, uh, particularly, providing legal support and counsel to that rising generation of activists. And I think we've got to, and it goes back to Reynolds' um, question, the role of uh, individual action and, 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 and mass movements. I think they remain absolutely essential. I think we've got to support um, the right-minded uh, activists. And sometimes people start off in the wrong direction and, and need a bit of steering uh, to bring them uh, back into the uh, frame. But I, I don't think somebody like your daughter, Frida, needs very much advice as, as, uh, 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 at all. I mean, I, I think what's changed is that when I started in the early 60s, even my parents thought I was a, a really strange mutation. Now, uh, you, I know, you and I joined uh, the, 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 that most recent major school strike demonstrations through Westminster. Their parents were there, their teachers were there. This was something that engaged yeah way beyond the classroom or a sort of particular social media group. Something's changing and something uh, is shifting quite powerfully. And I think it's really important. Thank you. Um, then we've got two questions and I just wanted to say, so there are a couple of questions on very specific on business and I am yeah. gonna come to them, but I wanna just make sure we flow through. There are a couple of questions, one from each side, I feel like on, on this changing and, and the dynamics so I'll read them both and then we can take them as we want so one again is from Ranald Boydell uh, the issue of generational change is interesting you talk about how old paradigms persist longer because the old have taught the young but also the importance of the school strikes of giving younger people experience in direct action and mm. in the book you mentioned the rise of universal schooling as a green swan uh, miracle and Project Drawdown priority of educating women but we want and need this to happen rapidly not to slow sort of generational timings if if so how do we do that should a key priority and you know this is just my heart John um, be to transform the educational agenda and enable younger people to have more of an active role in society so that's question one yeah uh, I'll give you the second one because they're coming from slightly different angles, um, which is Paul Ellingstad, uh, around the kind of transition and rebalancing and re-evaluation of power, for example, from men to women, yeah. um, from US to China, and, and other trends that you and we are seeing, and we are seeing that trend, by the way, Paul, from, from the US to China. Um, uh, how will Green Swan sort of emergence be influenced? if the power dynamics globally is moving from the US to China and again from male to female and maybe intergenerational as well. So those two pieces, you can take them how you wish. Yeah, I've tried both of those. And um, <laughs> on education, I think again there are seismic shifts happening in the, uh, the world of education where you look now at how schools are migrating online. It's not as effective as face-to-face, -face, but in some ways it could be even more effective because self-directed learning, I think is often a good, well, certainly in my case at school, it was much more powerful if I chose to um, pursue my own nose and I, then I was sort of forced to do things I didn't want to do. So I think the online educational world, you know, we've had MOOCs, we've had all of these different formats, many of them have been quite disappointing. But I think over time, you know, even in our day-to-day -day work, and I'm, I'm constantly on Google, uh, uh, I'm sure there are other search engines, but, and, and the amount of information that is now out there on everything, as, as long as you know where to look and, and what false facts might uh, look like and the rest of it, I think there is a shift in the availability of knowledge if people choose to use it, which is incredibly exciting and incredibly potentially uh, powerful and it's constantly said but um, this isn't uh, a period of our history where you go to school you go to college whatever and then you're done this is a period where ongoing uh, and continuous education is absolutely fundamentally important uh, perhaps Luke uh, come back on that loop later on but 
to the, the, the then the, the question around um, the, the this period where you've got shifts in geopolitics, for example, and you've got this uh, uh, gaining momentum around China versus uh, the United States. This happens every so often in our societies. Every single time it happens, there is a major war. And I, I don't say that lightly, and I think China, where I've worked uh, periodically, has often said they've learned from what happened to Prussia uh, when you know, Germany started to come together and then collided uh, with the British Empire. Uh, I don't think they have properly. I think some people there might have done. But I think what we're seeing now is uh, a very active scapegoating of the wider world for, for weaknesses in China's own uh, system. And very often what happens as those sorts of problems uh, become more aggravated is that a, a, a power that sees itself under threat starts to project the enemy outwards and attack it in order to sustain uh, its own political power dynamics. Mm -hmm. yeah. so I think we're in a very, very dangerous period. And the European Union, whether we like it or not, and I don't, is unraveling. We, we may not yet see that, but I think in 15 to 20 years, we'll look back at this period, not so much Brexit. Brexit was an early warning. What's happened between, say, Holland on one side and Italy now is a very uh, strident, striking warning that the EU is possibly, bless you, not long for this world. Thank you. <laughs> um, so that's interesting. And so do you, do you think that the, the COVID-19 is just a, has been a catalyst or just a, a mirror? Um, I think in some ways it, it will prove to have been a catalyst, but not necessarily. I mean, the Financial Times today was talking about populist leaders around the world, and we might assume, we might choose to believe that populists are going to be much endangered, that Trump might lose the election in November in the United States and so on. The piece was saying that the nature of populism is that these people are extremely canny and after a period where they miss, you know, misfire, they start to use the, uh, the, the emerging power dynamics. Uh, and, and then you look at Bolsonaro at the moment in uh, Brazil and you, thought, you think, what an idiot. He's, he's, he's uh, destined for the dustbin of history. But I don't underestimate the potential of people even like that uh, to reinvent themselves and to project themselves in a way that feeds people's fears and anger and then direct those against the white world. Look at what Trump is doing now with these gun-toting um, uh, champions, yes. states coming out of lockdown sooner up. I mean, it would be unbelievable 10 years ago if somebody told you that a president uh, of a country like that would be doing that. And I think that again, you're seeing an accelerated decomposition of a world order that we've taken for granted. And that world order took the Second World War, a crucible of suffering, to get people to get to the point where they, they, they would sacrifice sovereignty to create, for example, the Bretton Woods um, uh, yeah. institutions. I don't think we're anywhere near that again. And I think, in effect, in effect we're going to have to be forced to get to that point. But I'm an optimist. Yes. So I think um, I'll, I'll, I'll fight you for the optimism crown right now. but. Um, I want to hold you back to Paul's question, which was, how will these shifts, you know, if, if you're in effect saying that, that, that when, if we're not teetering on, there, there is more likelihood now of war um, and the dynamics that are happening, does that mean that green swans, or the, so the emergence of, of exponential positivity is more or less likely? Because it, there could be two ways, you know, you could say, right, this is the crisis is going to force more goodness forward um, and accelerate that just as rapidly as, as as some of the very negative things we've just touched on. Yeah, I'll come back to positivity. That's an opening. As my Australian friends say, look, um, <laughs> we're in a period where all all of the possibilities will happen, and it's our generational challenge to make sure that they're steered in the right direction. And those people who've at least skimmed the book will know that uh, early chapters uh, uh, explore the dynamics and nature of wicked problems and super wicked problems. So things like uh, plastics in the ocean, no one intended to 
uh, clog up the world ocean with plastic okay. debris. Antibiotic resistance. Uh, Alexander Fleming, one of the pioneers of antibiotic uh, science, warned that this would happen. It was inevitable. We would so abuse these miraculous compounds that we would build up resistance, and that would really uh, damage uh, healthcare. Uh, things like space debris, you know. <laughs> we were talking a moment ago, Paul asked the question around uh, geopolitics, and you look at what's starting to happen with China. I was in China when they shot down one of their own satellites. And that put 3,000 uh, pieces, substantial pieces of debris into space. Mm. Uh, India, India's done the same thing. And this is now you've got um, the US with its uh, space force and, and killer satellites and so on. We're, we're going quite rapidly towards a period where people start to um, shoot down each other's uh, satellites or jam them or whatever it is. So the, 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 the book has a section which is on those sorts of problems and their shared characteristics, which is they're so complicated and they're so bound into what we do and the way we think that in some ways, the more we try to solve them, the worse they get. And that's the nature of a, a wicked problem. Climate emergency probably being the, the worst of the lot and some people call that mm. a super wicked problem. So I think we need to go through that before, uh, I, I sometimes say, you know, uh, our species does its best work when it's been backed into a, a corner. And I think, you know, it, to uh, misappropriate um, Saddam Hussein's language, we've backed ourselves into the mother of all corners. And, and you know, in those moments, either things go spectacularly wrong and in the wrong direction, or a small but growing bunch of people again, innovate, uh, become entrepreneurial, try new things, have the risk appetite to, cope with failure and then out of that um, comes uh, a, you know, a sprawl of new uh, ventures and, and, and possibilities. Sure. I think that's where we are now. Good, um, so you know, I don't know if you're reading the chat but we have oh. a question that fits perfect, it's a perfect segue. Okay. Um, so Kasselenko, um asked, um, reading about some issues in sustainability of food and connecting with my experiences with middle management and middle upper management it seems that there is a hesitancy to do regenerative changes because they require sometimes sticking one's neck out and few yeah. want to be associated with failure it seems that the perfectionist behavior of just ignore and keep going with the status quo is emotionally safer and actually she's putting this to everybody so if you have a comment on this please put your answer in the chat and we can go through it a bit but how do you view that hesitancy to change because i guess that is one of the things that will hold back entrepreneurship and the and the positivity that you were just talking about but it's a mental sort of mindset piece isn't it you know and I, earlier on today i did an interview with a, a u.s uh, financial uh, publication and they were shocked to see how the trump administration uh, is uh, seeking to bail out the fracking industry. So here is a, um, a, a sector of the fossil fuels industry, which is not really needed in what comes next, uh, if we're trying to radically reduce our carbon footprint. Um, and yet we're it's teetering on the edge of, of, of bailing uh, those sorts of people out. And, and the consequence, if we don't, you know, um, hundreds of bankruptcies, uh, impact on banks, uh, just ahead of the US election. You know, it's almost inconceivable in a way. Um, remind me of what the question was. <laughs> this hesitancy in, um, in, in changing things to become more regenerative rather than sticking with status quo um, and safety, in a sense. It, 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 I guess it's a question, really. And Cass, if you want to add something we can unmute you you can explain a bit more but it's about emotional safety of of creating change in big organizations i believe i think very large organizations typically uh change when they're under stress and almost existential stress for a period of time you think about nike or shell and the um the 90, 1990s for example um and when I look at the companies that uh, I or we have worked with over the decades, um, 
very often you'll get a, a visionary CEO or a similar leader who will try and move things in the right direction. And then in a surprising number of those uh, companies, at least historically, you then get somebody who was almost their polar opposite coming in and taking over and swinging the needle back and or pendulum back in a different direction. That's not happening now in anything like the way that it once did. You're seeing people taking the baton of sustainability or of systemic change or whatever it's, however it's articulated. And, and one CEO, one, one C-suite. Uh, so like with Unilever, for example. Yes. Where uh, Alain Jop has actually picked up and, and created his own version of, of what was I, I, I think we, we, we um, uh, will see uh, more of um, that. But to the point of people not seizing on the uh, regenerative uh, capitalism, let's say, um, agenda. Well, why should they, in a sense? Because that, for most of them, seems utopian. I mean, how can a company, and we know Janine Benyus, we know Biomimicry 3.8, we know their work with Interface and the idea that you might create a factory or a city, which would be equivalent in terms of its environmental services, its carbon uh, dynamics and all the rest of it to the environment that was there, the natural environment, uh, before uh, the, the factory was built, the city uh, evolved, uh, or whatever. Um, so it, 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 I think it's unreasonable to expect individual companies and the sort of middle management and so on to, to seize on and embrace uh, regenerative um, uh, solutions. Having said which, Again, some people on the call will know that in the early 1990s, um, with my co-author, Julia Hales, I was sued for five months by um, McDonald's. We won the case, but it was pretty uh, existential moment uh, for us. Um, so I, I don't hold a torch for uh, McDonald's at all, uh, but recently they've started to uh, pioneer in regenerative soils management. So they're starting to mimic uh, the behavior of buffalo and so on uh, on the prairies rather than doing feedlot agriculture which basically destroys uh, the soil uh, it's mm -hmm. very poor for the animal uh, animal's health and it's actually pretty bad for uh, human health uh, as well so you, you're getting these uh, early forays into this regenerative space but i think the way much of it will come in is through resilience i think what we found is that the, resilient, the responsibility uh, approaches that companies have pioneered for decades now are fine as far as they go, but the climate emergency and everything else, they're accelerating all around us. And so whether you're a company with a supply chain or you're a city uh, you know, uh, about to be flooded, this stuff is pressing in and resilience is now the name of the game. But the only way, as we know, to ensure long-term resilience is to regenerate the systems uh, which buffer uh, and support our civilization, our economies, our companies and their supply chains. So there is a logic to this, but most people are still some way off uh, seeing that logic, let alone uh, behaving in the right way. Just going to pause. Cass, did that answer your question? Are we getting a nod? Otherwise, Natalie can unmute you and you can. Dig more. Okay. Oh, and I can see a question from, yes, from Anna. Anna. Yeah. We'll, we'll pick that up one second. Um, can I, in the meantime, we'll just, um, the, so McDonald's, it's a really interesting example because the the work we've done um together mainly done um on regeneration and and what that looks like from a company perspective scale is one of the enemies in a sense of 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 regeneration yeah and so it's so interesting that you have a company like mcdonald's which at least in my mind even if it's not completely true to the, uh, the business model is all about this you know the emblem of globalized um businesses that that they should take a lead on on regeneration and is there a risk because you know that they are doing some brilliant work on regenerative agriculture but but really most most at least academics who've, who've who've written over the last few decades about regenerative systems would say but you cannot have a globalized regenerative 
um, system. It has to be smaller systems. So McDonald's would have to be broken into small local, more local units um, and force like that. Is there a risk that when companies latch onto something like regenerative, that they, um, that they'll, I'm not going to call it greenwashing, but that they'll kind of steer, steer the language in the wrong direction. So we'll misunderstand what it means and thinks it's, it's about the, only about soil health. I'll answer the question, but in London, as you know, Louise, it's now six minutes past um, six, which my American family members, particularly the older ones, would say is the happy hour. So I'm going to have a little drink of wine. Oh, have a glass of wine. So inclined to do. Oh, good God. <laughs> <laughs> Your good health. Now, let me come back to regeneration. Firstly, many years ago, about uh, 40 years ago, perhaps even 50, I read a book uh, on the evolution of language. And whoever wrote the book was saying, in the early days of language, or new concepts, new memes, new terms, um, they, they, they have a subtlety, they vibrate. They, they vibrate like a sort of the eardrum or whatever, and they, they mm -hmm. understand uh, new thoughts through them. But uh, the more they use, the more they're kicked around, the more they're abused. Uh, the more they become as sensitive as the football bladder. I mean, sort of the leather surrounding of a, uh, a football. And, and in the end, they, they, they're not resonant at all. And I think most terms, I think of sustainability, which um, when we introduced, helped introduce that back in the uh, 1980s, was a semi-revolutionary term. Now it's just, you look at the beginning of this year, every media outlet, every company was talking about sustainability and that's to me as uh, um, a signal a warning signal that uh, a, a concept is actually being misunderstood it's being misused uh, and uh, i often say that as as terms as language come into the mainstream they get diluted and and some people on this uh, call on in, in this book club meeting may believe in homeopathy and I really don't. I just don't, I don't think you could dilute something to vanishingly uh, almost non-existent proportions and still have it have a, a miraculous catalytic effect. I think sustainability is fundamentally about making this world better for future generations of all species. I mean, not, not, not just of our uh, own. Most people don't think about that in, in that uh, way. So I think language is critical and I think one of the reasons why we've pulled in resilience, why we've pulled in regeneration is to try and refresh that language, to refresh that uh, change agenda by saying to people, it's lovely that you're talking about sustainability and it's wonderful that you're talking about the sustainable development goals and it's glorious that you can identify what you're doing against these five or six or whatever uh, global goals, but are you really in everything you do moving your system and over time the global system towards greater resilience and much more powerful regeneration and not just regeneration in terms of the biosphere although that's critical but across the triple bottom line so economic social community environmental political regeneration i think that has to be our uh, embraced agenda uh, it's certainly where i think this movement this industry has to go next i agree um and I, I'm going to jump to a question that came from um, Denise Delaney, who you know well. I do. Um, are we going to see Elaine on screen, or is she just hovering in the background? Elaine, would you like to come and just... No, no she says she's going to lurk. She's going to... <laughs> but thank okay, you. she's allowed to lurk. Um, so there's two questions from, um, from Denise. One is, resilience stage, do you think COVID-19 is forcing more businesses to this phase sooner than they might have otherwise. So positivity. Can, can, we, can we pause the button there? And the answer is, in, in the simplest of terms, absolutely. But what COVID-19 is also doing is like an X-ray. It's showing up the extraordinary defects of mo modern political uh, uh, systems. And less true in Denmark, your own country, less true in uh, Germany or, or South Korea, or the, though even in, 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 in some of these countries that, like Singapore, had a, uh, a, a, a near-term, mm. short-term uh, success, but, but the, these clusters of infections are now um, building. Um, 
I think the x-rays that we're now seeing suggest that not only are our societies ill-equipped to deal with a problem like COVID-19, they're also ill-equipped to deal with the climate emergency. So I was asked on, on this uh, interview earlier on today, um, did I think that the postponement of COP26, the Glasgow Climate Change uh, Conference in, in, in um, November was a bad thing? And my answer would have surprised me a few months back, which is because as you know, Louise, you've been working with the Scottish right. Environmental Protection Agency and a range of people uh, to try and put our best foot forward in, in Glasgow. I think it's a great thing that it's been postponed because I think the British government had not put sufficient effort into it. It was so distracted by Brexit. Italy, even in the best of times, is a slightly problematic uh, country in terms of geopolitics. So you put those together and you don't have the sort of political engine, which I think we actually need. So if it is postponed to May of next year and the COVID-19 uh, crisis is seen to be under control by then, and we can draw the lessons from what we've just been through or are still going through, um, I think that could be quite powerful because this is, a, this is something that's got through to people in a way that climate change singularly has failed to do. Even in Australia, you know, <laughs> They've had this catastrophe with a billion animals uh, uh, grilled alive and, and so on. And as you know, one of the companies we were working yes. with, Fiona, uh, we were talking to a, um, an Australian member of their team just recently. And they were saying, the interesting thing about the fires in Australia is they brought people together. And what COVID-19 has done is to split people apart, you know, with hoarders and, 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 and so on. Now, I don't know yet whether this is going to be something that brings us together ultimately or pulls us apart. I think there are a bunch of people, uh, some of whom I've named on the populist politician front, who are doing their absolute damnedest to pull things apart. It's up to us now to continue to push things uh, into a convergence strategy, but in new directions. Okay. Yeah, that's a big ask, um, and it leads quite nicely into Denise's second question, which is about trade associations, yeah. um, who seem to have been born with a desire for advocacy and lobbying for status quo, and sort of traditionally known for slowing down sustainability. Um, if that is true, will an era of green swans mean an end to trade associations, or do you expect them to evolve, change in purpose and practice? or be replaced by new types of collaborations. And as we sort of imagine more green swans in the future, will that collaboration within a sector be more or less important? Like I know that we, you and I have had conversations with um, uh, CBI here in the UK. Oh, ah, there's Elaine. Um, Moving in view. Elaine. Um, we've had conversations with CBI where yeah. they have have kind of shifted to being proactively lobbying for good rather than um, rolling back re uh, regulation and legislation and, and status quo lobbying. But I'll let you answer the question. <laughs> it, 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 it's, it's a tough one. And, and Denise, uh, exactly what I expect from you and thank you for it. Um, I look at the Vatican, for example, as a completely, dis I, I should say, um, uh, I, I have nothing against Catholicism per se, but um, the Vatican has been around for an extremely long time, for centuries and centuries and centuries, and it's, it's evolved throughout that time to just about do enough to keep itself uh, on its feet. I think many trade and industry federations will have the same sort of survival instinct and will evolve to do enough to keep themselves uh, in existence. As you say, Louise, the CBI has gone through a period where they're suddenly saying things and they're suddenly doing things which I absolutely would have not expected them to say. And I think some of that comes from a, a, a guy, Josh Hardy, who spoke at our uh, Tomorrow's Capitalism Forum in, in, in January. And he came from Tesco, but he, he, he brings a very different mindset. But I also think it, it, it speaks to where bodies like the CBI go. To Denise's question specifically, I think over the last 30 years, we've seen growing competition between platforms, business to business platforms. So once upon a time, you would have had the International Chamber of Commerce and you'd have the CBI and you'd have people like that, the uh, American Chemistry Council, and they would 
broadly have resisted uh, change and anything to do with systemic change they really wouldn't have wanted to know anything about. Then you had groups like Business Council for Sustainable Development, what now calls itself WBCSD. You've had uh, the UN Global Compact with over 10,000 companies involved. You've had the B team, it's only 20 some CEOs, but, but again, uh, uh, agitating um, the system. You've got groups in supply chain uh, uh, dynamics, people like Amphori in, in, in continental Europe. Uh, so you've got this competitive pressure building on some of the mainstream uh, bodies. And then you take one example one person who very kindly did the foreword uh, for the book Green Swans, and that's Paul Pullman, former CEO of um, Unilever, St. Paul, I mean, you might uh, call him, and he pops up all over the place, and I love him to pieces. But if you think about specifically in the area of trade and industry federations, he was on the board or chairman of World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the World Economic Forum, the UN Global Compact, the B Team, you name it. Now, most of those platforms have had a few scores or a few hundreds of members, corporate members, now chairing, as many of you will know, the International Chamber of Commerce with 45 million business members. Now, that's a, that's a, that's a, a, a jump in scale of quite extraordinary proportions. Now, I don't know whether Paul can rein in and then redirect the International Chamber of Commerce but I think he's also, his very appointment is signaling that there is a growing demand for that sort of uh, leadership. So I don't, I don't expect even some of the most recalcitrant um, uh, federations and associations to go away. But just remember, in the early part of this century, uh, when we, for example, were working with Ford Motor Company and Bill Ford in particular, we made it a condition of going in to work with them that they had to resign from certain federations. There was the American Climate Coalition. Now, I'm not saying one thing led to another, but they did indeed, as did BP and other companies, resign from the American Climate Coalition, who we've not heard from very much uh, since. So I think there is a shakeout going on. We've got to help drive it. And the more we can benchmark what these different platforms do and hold them to account, uh, the better. That so, um... <laughs> Denise, I hope that answers your question. I, I think it does. In the meantime, there's a lot of um, great conversation happening on the chat to the point that I'm not going to read it all out because uh, it's more comments um, than questions that around this idea of the combination of a visionary leader and yet you also need incentives within the, the organization in order to drive these, these changes. And the one thing I will do, a little plug for some of the work we've done on Taurus Capitalism Inquiry is this, we've, we've actually mapped this out, what we think is needed in terms of both um, external functions of a company and internally what is needed in order to become a catalyst for change. So that's in our briefing, Anna and Cass and Sophia, that we can absolutely send you um, a summary of um, quite easily. Let, you're welcome to add to it, John, but... I, I think that's um, well, let, um, let's, uh, pose yeah, a question. You, 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 I'm yeah. not looking at the um, chat column because I, I think I would be mightily distracted. I'm, I'm relying you. <laughs> you would. I know you. The best <laughs> coming through there. But a question to Natalie. Um, and we had this earlier on. Uh, can we copy what's in the chat uh, channel and 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 save that? Because I think when the Zoom call ends, we tend possibly to lose that. Maybe it's there as part of the recording, but can we just make sure that, that uh, we do? Uh, sure. Um, I was going to pull up one little thing. So, so one of the points that's made that I thought was, was a suitable kind of question to you in a sense was that um, it's potentially about how we measure success and the triple uh, bottom line approach. Um, that if we continue to measure success in the same way, we're never really going to start on that journey well, I, I as was, a business. I was talking so busy from about Sophia. that panel that I forgot the incentives question and then measuring success. Um, two things, and perhaps to try and address both of those questions at the same time. I think incentives are absolutely fundamental and you started to see some leadership leading companies uh, putting, putting incentive structures in for their 
C-suite executives. So for example, a quarter of their uh, reimbursement um, coming from incentives linked to performance against decarbonization or whatever. I think that's fundamentally important. I think it's often forgotten. People think they can just declare ambitions and then go on with business as usual. I don't think that's remotely true. But what's true within business, which we have to incentivize people, is also true uh, in, in the wider world. And I look at what is going on with this incredible, unimaginable, inconceivable bailout, multi-trillions of dollars and euros of, of, of businesses, large and small, state-owned, publicly uh, listed, family-owned, whatever. What we're going to have to do in very short order is put conditions on that funding. And I say that because we've got to bring incentives uh, to shift people's thinking, to improve their performance, not just in terms of, for God's sake, do not put us in this situation again, where you over leverage as the, um, the fracking companies have done in the United States. And now they're going, you know, because they're going to go bankrupt very, very quickly. Uh, we've got to put incentives that tell people, we'll give you money, we'll discuss whether we uh, treat it as a loan or a grant or whatever it is, we'll give you money, but in terms of the payback, society wants you to demonstrate, it could be in three years, it could be in five years, radical decarbonization. Now at the moment, we tried that with CBI, and they said, no, it's too early, we can't do that. But we've got to get to that point where we start politically to impose conditions on business for, yes. for continuing support and of their business models. Yeah, and I guess we're seeing that in some countries already, right? So yeah. we're seeing, so we're seeing um, Denmark and I think Austria put in um, criteria for both whether you're paying tax in the country, which yeah. seems a really obvious yeah. thing, but as we've just heard from Richard Branson, who's been making impassioned pleas all day, um, that ha isn't the case here but also the decarbonization, I think, was the Austrian policy. Yeah. And I would go even further that, you know, most, we now have an opportunity to weigh companies out and are they creating something, a product or a service that is needed in the world? Not that we want, i.e., you know, cheap um, disposable fashion or whatever, but, but is it needed and is it produced in a way that is respectful of the trickle bottom line and regenerative for both society and and the environment which goes back we're a bit far from that though we are Sorry. and it goes back to the question around the triple bottom line and how we measure uh, performance progress and ultimate success and i think we've made a lot of progress over the last 25 years since um, i introduced the the concept but i don't think we've made quite as much as i would have hoped are we able to say there's a drop-in solution where we can suddenly measure all of these different types of performance in an integrated way and put a value on as, as as you know we're working with novartis in switzerland at the moment on how do you put a financial valuation on different forms of negative and positive impact and i think that is something that is absolutely crucial as the next day I, I i'm nervous i don't think most things that we might want to um, measure are translatable in short order into a financial valuation, but I think we can sometimes do reasonable proxies uh, of that. Um, but I think the impact um, management project is another initiative with I, which I can you know, yes, great work. You know various people there. But with, when I first saw their first round of work, I was distressed because I felt uh, this is not giving me all of the drop in answers that I would want to say how this is to a company. This is how you measure your different form of impact. But what they are doing at the impact management project is crystallizing, simplifying, bringing things down to the absolute basics everyone can agree on. And from that point of consensus, then I think we have the basis to then drive change at an accelerated uh, rate. But some of this is going to have to be instinctive. If we simply do, we try and drive systemic change through accounting procedures, we're going to um, just <laughs> run ourselves off the yes, way. Yes, that's not going to work. Um, so I'm now very aware of time. So I'm going to make one comment um, from the chat, one question, and then um, I'm going to wrap it up with a little bit of information about um, yeah. next book club. 
So the the comment that I'm just going to find again was um, from from Teen Ward on um, on women. So um, she's saying I was also thinking about the undervalued work of women over decades, and to John's point about war, exactly why we need to recognise the role of women in peace building and formal and informal peace processes proven that they last much longer and are better negotiated by women uh, when women are directly involved. So I think that's the comment. I would think we can only agree with that team. Um, and then the question, if that's okay, um, mm. which is from Moses Choi. He says, over the years, business model innovation literature has treated sustainability in the context of product innovation, environmental primarily, or bespoke uh, markets like forestry, etc. Yet the business model has been mostly neglected in academic and pr practitioner orientated literature on corporate sustainability and corporate sustainability management. One reason is that sustainability management is multidimensional, creating inherent challenges for analysis given the complexity of the issue. Yes. Another is that the case for a business case for sustainability has historically been seen as ad hoc and supplemental to core business. What is the one thing that will make this change? And he's suggesting, is it investor demand? So one question, you know, we have three minutes at the moment. Well, th thank you again for the question. For those who don't know me, my email address is john at fire.com. <laughs> Always happy to continue uh, conversations um, like these. Um, I think it will be a mixture as ever of stress and opportunity, of challenges and opportunities. And I think the black swans that we've helped create unintentionally largely are coming home to roost. And I think this decade, the next few decades, we'll see many of the black swan problems that I've, I've uh, addressed from plastics in the ocean to uh, space debris uh, really pressing in on one industry after another. But at the same time, the mar market potentials here, the, the opportunity for change and to be part of one of the biggest adventures in, in, in the history of our species is off the scale exciting. I, I have to say, I feel more charged up, more positive, more optimistic than I have for a very long time. Strikingly in the middle of the, a point where the old order is unraveling, but it, I think it has to for the new order to find its feet. So I'll stop there, but thanks everyone for being part of this. And I can't tell you how much I look forward to the next one. <laughs> where I won't Perfect be the segue. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, thank you, John. Um, thank you everybody for, for asking questions. Um, I think Natalie will post the details of the next one in, our, in the chat, and, but it, it should be live now to sign up for it. It will be with Denise Hearn, and her book that she co-authored with Jonathan Tepper called The Myth of Capitalism. And in short, it's a kind of fascinating practical analysis of the dysfunctionality of contemporary capitalism, making a case that um, reinvigorating competition is vital to make capitalism work for people and planet. Um, she's a very practical, very energetic lady, and it will be 21st of May, so it's a Thursday, not um, Thursday, 21st of May at 5 p.m. or 1700 hours UK time. And um, I'm sure Natalie's posting all this right now as we speak and will, um, with a link to sign up. Um, it will also be uh, noted in our newsletter if you get that, which you can sign up to on our website. Um, is there anything else we want to say? Tomorrow's Earth Day. And John alluded to it very early on. Um, we hope you will all celebrate it. We've got um, a, an interview with the founder of Earth Day done by John on our, on our webpage, just gone live, if you want to know more about it or how you can support, because it it's truly has been um, a catalyst for massive change. Um, and that is all from me. Normally when we do these, when we don't do them so often with so many people, we have everybody switch their cameras on and be unmuted and you can all say hello and goodbye to each other. Should we try that, Natalie? She says yes. Yeah. Goodbye. She says yes. Goodbye. <laughs> Goodbye, oh, everyone. Hey. Bye, everyone. 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 Bye, everyone.